Today we're in celebration mode because we've hit a milestone. You're currently watching our 100th episode. In four seasons, we have featured over 600 artists from all across the country. From a nine-year-old jag queen to a 98-year-old painter, we have covered the gamut. So today, we wanna to find out what some of our artists have been up to, revisit some of our most watched short docs, and bask in the brilliance of some of Canada's most creative minds. I'm Amanda Paris, and this is CBC Arts Exhibitionist. <laughs> Back in season one, we hung out with Rupi Kaur in her bedroom and talked poetry, Instagram, and menstruation before watching her give a reading at a local chapters. Since then, both of her books have become bestsellers, she sold out stadiums, received co-signs from Alicia Keys, had her work translated into 40 languages, and outsold Homer's Odyssey. Yeah, she's killing it. Here's a look back at Rupi Kaur just as she was on the cusp of all this success. My name is Rupi Kaur and I am a spoken word artist and author. When I first started to write, I was writing to kind of, like I didn't really have like a purpose or like a thesis, kind of like, okay, this is what I want to write about and this is what it's going to sound like. It was literally just me finding a form of expression that was so cathartic to me and I was like, I have to keep going. I didn't plan to ever share my work online. Um, I don't even know why I did. There was one girl following me from Seattle and um, we were kind of like online like Twitter friends and then she commented and it was like a poem about sexual abuse and she commented and she said, your poetry makes me feel like a woman. I don't know, like that comment from all the comments that I've read over the past like two years, like that was the one I read it and I was like, I can't stop now. And it just became like this small community of women that were like, we were finally talking about these things that were just so common, but they were so taboo to discuss. Apparently, it is ungraceful of me to mention my period in public, because the actual biology of my body is too real. It is okay to sell what's between a woman's legs more than it is okay to mention its inner workings. The recreational use of this body is seen as beautiful, while its nature is seen as ugly. I'd always had this like photo series on my mind because I've always had like struggled with my period. So I was like, how do I learn how to celebrate this moment? I've always learned how to celebrate my life through my artwork. And I assume that, you know, like my 30,000 followers at that time, they know the type of work that I do, you know, they've read my work, so this is nothing new. And so when I posted it, like everybody was saying such lovely things, you know, like the outcome was exactly how I expected. But it wasn't till a day later when it kind of started to reach outside of my original 30K followers and people started to get angry and I guess people were reporting it and like, like all the nasty comments came at once and I was like sitting in class like, whoa, what do I do? And then 24 hours after posting, Instagram took it down. Like what the heck, like how did somebody, like a human being that like, came from a womb, like how did this person like sit there and think that like this is unsafe? Instagram is like full of pornography and like visuals that are so unintelligent sometimes and are, are so horrific and are so harmful to us. And you're gonna tell me like that's harmful? Like, ugh, I, it was just disappointment. And I was like, I'm gonna do it again. Like, how dare you? And that's when it literally turned from like, it just turned from being like a small project to like my form of protest. But of course, eight hours later, they took it down again. And so this time I posted this screenshot of like them telling me that it was removed. I posted on Facebook when I got home that day that like this had happened and I was like in this moment of like anger and passion. And I wrote this like supercharged message. And um, I came home and the post had like 4 million hits. And I was like, why did I do that? Like, I just kept myself into trouble. <laughs> and then after that, I went to bed 
I woke up and both of my photos were back. In like what world do you get to like force this corporation to like give that back to you? Like that never happens. Without further ado, if you could all help me welcome to the stage, Miss Ruby Core. You know, all these people came for this photo, but like, are they even gonna stay for the poetry? Like, I wish they came for the poetry instead. But you know, they have stayed for the poetry and it's been really good. And so it's just been learning how to like, take that as like a good thing because I'm such a nervous person that I forget to enjoy the moment. I am water, soft enough to offer life, tough enough to drown it away. Throughout this episode, I'll be bringing back some fan favorites with snippets from our most loved and most shared segments. We begin with a unique doll maker. Who needs Barbie when you can get a bitch Kova? Back in season one, we hung out with Marina Bichkova, who crafts intricately detailed dolls that take over 500 hours to make and sell for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Take a look. My name is Marina Bichkova, and I'm a figurative artist. The reason I love making dolls is because it's such a multidisciplinary art form. It doesn't just involve painting or sculpting or design. It involves all these different aspects. There's just so many steps to a doll, and that's what makes it so engaging for me, so interesting. I think if it was just one, one medium, I think I'd get bored with it. It's all these challenges of combining all these mediums into this one sort of cohesive, autonomous picture is what really excites me about doll making. A new doll can take me between two weeks and a month, while a costume doll can take seven months, eight months, two years even. I think that new dolls create a, a bigger impact than costume dolls because it Makes, um, it makes us confront our sexuality and our vulnerability uh, that I think we all have. I like juxtaposing the nudity of the doll with different um, uh, sort of taboo subjects in our society, uh, such as sexuality, for example. A lot of dolls I grew up with and I still see, they're um, asexual they have been cleansed of all sexuality, which I think is extremely wrong because it creates body issues for girls where there shouldn't be any body issues or shame. And so I think naked dolls have this a lot of potential to um, examine our shame and our outrage at seeing a naked doll with full mature um, sexual organs and question why it disturbs us and uh, why it's wrong or right. So that possibility, that dimension of a naked doll really intrigues me. Coming up, we revisit our time in Cape Dorset when we met a 13-year-old stone carver. I learned how to carve from my dad. My dad made this. You know, I usually work with uh, illustration agency, publicity agency, and they often have a specific direction they want me to take. Um, so I just came up with this uh, exercise to, to be more apt to create in a spont more like a spontaneous way. Uh, the best work that we do is often done when we just, we just go with the flow, you know, we are not trying too hard. So it's, it's never about making something beautiful just for the beauty of it. It's more about having this connection, I guess, with the nature. 
and um, by doing that it just um, it just comes out beautiful because nature is beauty for me yeah no, I think she's uh, she's agreeing with me yeah <laughs> Over the years, we've showcased a ton of super talented kids, from a ballet dancer to a wildlife photographer, from a doll maker to a portrait painter. And then there's 13-year-old David Pudlat. He's a young artist from Cape Dorset, following his father's footsteps and bringing traditional Inuit art to a new generation. David Pudlat, <laughs> My name is David Pudlet. I am 13 years old. I love to carve and draw. I lived in Cape Dorset my whole life. School is art and gym. I don't remember the time that I didn't like art. I love to draw on my sketchbook. I love to draw a bullhead whale. And I love to draw walrus because my dad goes walrus hunting a lot. I learned how to carve from my dad. My dad made this. I hope he caught one. He's out hunting right now. If he caught one, I want if it climbs in the belly. The first thing that I carve is an inukshuk. Inukshuk represents Nunavut. People chooses a stone. They look for sizes and colors. I'm thinking to make something with this. Look sure. People use a grinder, and I use a saw and fire. First, I make a line, and then I saw some of it. Usually, in chips, there's six six rocks. Almost. It looks like a human, but made of rocks. I've carved a bird and a nookshik and a fish. And now sanding. Sanding is my favorite part. And I'm gonna have to polish it. I wish it was summer. I would carve more. Six or seven years old, I drew a man trying to catch a seal. Some person said, you're good, and then just started to practice more. Yeah, it's done. In the future, I'd like to be an artist. Making art is fun, and I want to keep doing it. Coming up, we check in with the Twitter alien turned best-selling book author and illustrator. I felt that it made sense for me as a Canadian in America and kind of someone who's always felt like a little bit of an outsider to, um, to be an alien. In paper cutting, you work with negative space. 
So it's a subtractive medium. You're taking away what isn't supposed to be there. Today, I'll be cutting a miniature house. I begin by sketching the design. Paper is an interesting material in that it's basically everywhere. It wraps chopsticks, it's on receipts, it's just on every printing surface. It's such a quotidian material, so bringing it into light, exploring the sculptural possibilities of paper, I can physically cut away at something to the point where it's barely even there anymore. At first, when I was doing it, I was like, I can't wait until I'm near the end of the project because it was so intimidating. But I was surprised by the amount of momentum that I still had in making this work. And it just didn't feel right at that point to stop. It turns out you guys really love paper art. This video has over a million views on our YouTube channel. Since we hung out with this next artist, Alberta's own Johnny Sun, who you may know on Twitter as a verified alien, he's collaborated on a best-selling book with his hero, Lin-Manuel Miranda, appeared on Late Night with Seth Meyers, been featured in NPR, GQ, and Playboy, and Time Magazine named him one of the 25 most influential people on the internet. Here he is, a few years earlier, on Earth, about to see his play on opening night. So it goes, Look, life is bad, everyone's sad, we're all gonna die. But I already bought this inflatable bouncy castle, so are you gonna take your shoes off or what? My name is Johnny Sun, and I tell dumb jokes on the internet. I have about 180,000 followers now, which is totally crazy to me. It's a number that I can't, I can't even like understand what that number means. So my Twitter account is kind of based on this character of an alien um, who doesn't spell things entirely correctly. Uh, I kind of chose that character because I felt, I don't know, I felt that it made sense for me as a Canadian in America and kind of someone who's always felt like a little bit of an outsider to, um, to be an alien. Being on social media and being um, someone with a large audience is such a rewarding experience because when I get to write and I get to put it out there and literally hundreds of thousands of people can engage with the work that I do. But at the same time, you're, you're connecting to people behind screens, right? Theater, I think, is the complete opposite of that where you have to be in the same room as the other people to experience it. Any form of art that brings us together in the same space as human beings occupying the same room together, I think, is incredibly important. Hey, why would you, why would you come out of us being attacked? Hello? The play I wrote, Dead End, is um, about two survivors of a zombie apocalypse who find themselves stuck in a dead end hallway in an abandoned school, and they are trapped from the open end by a zombie who shows up. Going into the theater world and putting my name on this thing, um, it's, my, it's my first stake as a real artist and someone with something to say, perhaps, off offline and off the internet. I think I found theater and drama class to be kind of my home in high school. And I think everywhere else, I didn't really feel like myself or I thought I was playing a role that I was supposed to play. I think my younger self would say, what took you so long? You should have been doing this your whole life. I'd like to think that I'm representing him as well in, in the work that I'm doing now. Someone tweeted at me, I've never wanted to see a play before. And I've never wanted, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> um, I've never wanted to be, to watch theater before. And because I follow you on Twitter, I have this urge to go see this play. And I think if, if I can bring one person into the theater community and to show them like how amazing being in a space with people and being with performers and being in a theater um, is, 
worth it. And I think it's totally, like everything has been worth it just for that one person. We want to thank every artist featured on the past 100 episodes of CBC Arts Exhibitionists for opening their doors to us and sharing their craft and process with our cameras. And a special thanks to all of you for tuning in each week and supporting the work of Canadian artists across the country. If you know any artists that you think should be featured in the next 100 episodes of CBC Arts Exhibitionists, send me a message on social media. Our handle on all platforms is at CBC Arts. We've been lucky enough to talk with a lot of people at the start of their careers. But before we go, we also want to take some time to celebrate the legends who come to CBC Arts and share their wisdom. Here's theater icon Janet Sears and her words of advice to young artists. Peace. If you really want to write, if you really want to create, there are a number of ways to do it. There's no one right way. But one way that might encompass all of them is what I call the Nike method. Just do it. Bum in seat. Bum in seat with a writing implement in front of you. Steal time, because there's no time to write. Steal a minute a day. Write a sentence a day. In three years, you'll have a full play. That's with no time. Just imagine if you had a little bit more time. There's a boldness to youth. Take that excitement you have for the project, make sure it interests you, and just write what you want to say about it. Not what you think other people want you to say, not what your parents want you to say, not what your friends think you should be saying. Say what you want to say about it. Be unique. <laughs>